a, a little bit of my background, because probably I don't know hardly any of you guys, and I'm sure you probably don't know anything about me, but, uh, you know, I, I grew up, I went to high school in a small town in Nebraska, no high school baseball, everything was football. Uh, from there, went to a junior college, played baseball, and I went to a small, uh, I guess it's a D2 school now, NAI school in Nebraska at Kearney. And, uh, hey, but growing up in that state, you had, you had two people that uh, were, were, you know, everything in that state, Tom Osborne at Nebraska. And then the first time that I ever had any inkling about any type of strength training and stuff like that was obviously Boyd Epley, who's kind of the godfather of, of strength coaches. And, and uh, so that was kind of the first thing as far as getting into the strength training part of it. We didn't. We lifted, so everybody had a universal machine, you know, way back in high school and did all those things. But uh, he was kind of the first guy. And then when my last year, I uh, thought I was going to be a coach. So I, I uh, joined the National Strength Coaches Association. And, and it was kind of interesting because uh, Nebraska had, I think it was called Nebraska Strength or whatever. And, and it was like a media guide like they used to have for all sports. And and uh, they would send it out. And, and the big thing everybody wanted to look at was the bench press. And, and back then, very few guys over 300 pound bench press, and maybe one or two 400 pound guys. But that was kind of the foray into in some, in some type of strength training. But uh, it was interesting. And then obviously involved with Mike Arthur and has kind of gone on from there. But uh, uh, it, when I first started a baseball, for the most part, we had no lifting very seldom ran, did any of that kind of stuff. Um, and, and as I started uh, my coaching career, I started my master's work. Uh, I was very fortunate in the fact that at the time uh, I had a gal that, that taught uh, uh, exercise phys class and I got, I got my master's in exercise physiology. And she was kind of one of the foremost people on movement and balance. And at the time I kind of hated her and she, I'm sure she hated me. I, I didn't really know when a great student and, and uh, but now looking back, uh, it was phenomenal what she uh, she taught us, what we went over and, and those type of things, which carries over. I mean, they have all these different things going on now. She was probably way ahead of her time. And so I wasn't a pitcher, I was a position guy, but her baseline of uh, balance, uh, movement patterns, mobility, all those things that she taught us, in the, in the early to mid eighties uh, carries over greatly to today. I mean, it's, 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 it's amazing where she was at at the time. And, uh, and so kind of went on from there. My first seven years, I did strength training, uh, you know, had somewhat of an idea. We did all major muscle stuff. I mean, we did, we did incline press or overhead press. We did pinch, we did lap pull downs. Uh, we did knee extension in, uh, and then knee curls or leg curls. Everybody had a hip sled. That was, I mean, unbelievable. You walk into any weight room, everybody had a hip sled. So we, we that was kind of our deal. Uh, did a ton of abdominal stuff, and we maxed like every three or four weeks. It, it became a competitive deal. I think we did some good things, uh, but obviously not to the point of what we're doing nowadays. Um, so that's kind of my background as far as strength training and, 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 uh, and then I, and then kind of to tell you how I got in the pitching side of it, my first job, uh, I was hired at Howard junior college as the trainer first. Um, uh, and then I taught, I think nine to 12 hours a semester, uh, drove the bus for the basketball team, everything. And then the guy goes, can you do pitching? And anything to get a college job, I said yes. So that's kind of my foray into it. And I was very fortunate to use that as a, a, a lab, testing lab to work on different things. And that's kind of how it evolved uh, on how I became a pitching guy. Anyway, long story short, that's my bio very quick. Uh, they asked me to, you know, talk about what do I look for in high school pitchers and athletes? Uh, very generalized question. I mean, you can go a lot of different directions and how do I work with Q on a daily basis? Um, when I first got hired at the junior college, the, the old guy, and I say old, he's probably my age, maybe younger at the time, but uh, he, hey, I was going to do all the recruiting. And his, two, his, his big spiel was, 
And when you go out, look for knocked, knocked need hitters and pitchers that have sloped shoulders. And I'm sitting there going, what's he talking about? Well, you know, and this guy had won a couple of junior college national championships. And I think I thought I knew, you know, the entire spectrum of, of what uh, baseball was, except a little bit for pitching. I'd done my master's thesis on pitching mechanics, but I thought, and I know everything about it. And it, so he, this, that's all I gave me. Hey, look for knock knee hitters, pitches to slope shoulders. And, and as I got out there, and as obviously as I got, I've gotten older, I figured out the guy was a really good baseball guy. But um, uh, knock knee hitters, hey, the balance is between their, between their legs. Their knees are inward a little bit, and so they have great balance when they hit. And sloped shouldered pitchers, I figured out that, hey, man, they're a little bit looser in their arms. They're not stiff. Their arm works free and easier. So that was my, that was, hey, as you go out and recruit, go get these type of guys. And, and so after a while, I'm going, hey, man, maybe he didn't know, he didn't give me a whole lot, but what he gave me right there was a small sample of guys with balance that are in the batter's box and guys with loose arm actions as pitchers. Very generalized, very simple, but it, it, it made a lot of sense. All right, so to get into the first question, what do I look for in a pitcher, um, an athlete, first and foremost? And, and that, that comes in a lot of different shapes and sizes. I, 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 you know, uh, I was very fortunate with my son. He played in the big leagues for, for a while. And, uh, you know, so everybody asked me about, you know, him and some different things. Being an athlete as a pitcher can mean a lot of different things. I've had uh, a bunch of guys pitch in the big leagues from five foot nine and left-handed to six six left-handed, five eight five nine right-handers to six seven six eight right-handers, all different shapes and sizes. But most of them have some type of athletic ability. And I'm not talking about jumping out of the gym or or running a hundred you know, meter dash in, in world record times or anything like that. But most of them have the ability to do something that allows them to be successful in the baseball field. And it's interesting. We have a Smokies close to us here in town. You go out there and every guy looks exactly like, or I shouldn't say everyone, but most of them look exactly like the scouts want them to look. I mean, great bodies, uh, good arms, and you go, Hey man, how do these guys kind of separate themselves? And then you get to the big legs, and you see all kinds of different shapes and sizes. And uh, and so uh, you got guys that are overweight. You got guys that are uh, six five and weigh one hundred and seventy five pounds. And those guys, you know, obviously can can do some different things. Where as a scout, I'm looking for these base deals because you have to fill those boxes of the numbers of, hey, this guy's this, this guy's that, this guy's that. And then actually in the big leagues, you got to pitch and you got to win games and you got to have success. And so they start to separate themselves out like that. Uh, I'll kind of give you, here's my, uh, as you talk about what's the, what's the perfect guy to look for or what if you look for that perfect guy. I'll tell you my moment, I was, I, I think I was still coaching in junior college. Maybe I was at Texas Tech at the time. I walk into a high school game and, uh, and it's crazy. I come up over the top of the stadium and look down. It's a high school playoff game in Texas. And it's almost like the clouds parted and the sun, you know, shone right down on this guy. And it was Kerry Wood. I mean, 6'5", 195 pounds. I mean, the arm worked phenomenal, uh, very athletic. Uh, could do so many different things on the field. He, a great high school team there at Grand Prairie High. And, uh, I mean, it wasn't two years later that he strikes out 20 guys against the Astros in the big leagues. And so, yeah, that, those, those guys are, are easy to pick out. And, and, and I was, as I was thinking about this stuff, that's probably my base guy that you go, okay, as you look at somebody in comparison, because we're all in comparisons, on different things, that would be my guy. Walk in, Terry Wood is, is the ultimate guy. And then the, it, it's kind of crazy. I saw him pitch one week the next week and show you how things have changed a little bit. He uh, he started, I, I believe, now I'm, I'm probably a little off base, but I can't remember whether he leave and then started, but he went like seven innings of the first game, won the first game, started the second game, and went two or three innings of the second game. 
something like that. And uh, and it, it was one of the most impressive times I've ever seen. Obviously, nobody would allow him to probably do that again nowadays, but that's kind of what it was at the time. So that's kind of my my guy. Uh, from a pitching standpoint, what what guy what what are in the major leagues? Everybody always wants to look at the major league guys and and try to okay, how do our guys compare to them? It's just a different deal. I mean, some of those guys are, are hey, they can they can stand on their head and throw it over the plate. Uh, but because uh, they're they're just different ability wise than a, a lot of our guys. The the one thing that that is a a uh, a true deal if if they if they if they have all kinds of crazy mechanics, most of those guys are relievers. They're one inning guys that they're going to go out there and blow it out and uh, and you know maybe walk two guys and punch out three guys for their one inning or thing. And then things have evolved obviously from. From you know when I first started, but uh, uh, you know, and they've dropped forty minor league clubs, which tells you something about college baseball and what Major League Baseball thinks about us because of the uh, the number of uh, development, you know, with Q and and the pitching side and the training side and the nutrition and all that. I think we've done such a good job at the college level. They dropped about forty minor league clubs, and so it kind of tells you what they think about college baseball. Uh, so anyway, um, you know, I talked about athletes. Yeah, I, I want a guy that can repeat his mechanics, uh, have it or have a chance to have a repeatable delivery because uh, I like strike throwers. Uh, it's a little different between starters and relievers. Uh, the, the reliever maybe doesn't have to have as a, a, a great a time as far as repeating his delivery, like I said, because of the fact that. And maybe you can walk to and then punch out the side. I don't really like it that way, but that's you see that a lot of times. Uh, the start, excuse me, a starter, and you've got to be able to repeat that thing time after time after time. If you can't, then you're probably not going to have much success down the line. You know, when I first got this job, and and Josh Elander, our recruiting coordinator, came to me and goes, "Hey, what do you look for in a pitcher, uh, or what do you want in this and that?" He's done such a great job for us. Uh, I sent him a video of the last 30 Cy Young winners and and some of the things that that matched up on each guy is at release their head was on line with home plate. I mean there wasn't a bunch of a head whack and a, a bunch of you know off balance stuff and different things like that and there only was really one outlier and that was Tim Lincecum and you know, he was whatever he was, six foot, 155 pounds. And I read a deal where his dad and him came up with, you know, how to throw and get the maximum pork out of that body. And I mean, he was phenomenal for a, a period of six, seven, eight years. And, uh, but most of them, hey, at release, their heads online, maybe a little bit of tilt, but the balance and the repeatability of their mechanics uh, was all pretty much the same for, I mean, starting out back there like for the last 30 guys and it, it was all pretty much the same all the way through there was a repeatable delivery at release everybody had eye contact where their eyes were nobody was crazy off to the side and so um you know i thought that was one thing that so when i go out um uh, i look for that and, and it's also you know can you can you change somebody and i i would truly believe that when they're born or you're born that you have a natural arm sling and your arm works a certain way. I and mean, a lot of times we get in the way and we try to change things up. And I'm not sure we always change them from the, from, you know, to the better, because uh, like I said, I think there's a natural arm swing that your body has when you're born, that you're, that you can develop over time. And then we work with guys and all of a sudden, you know, especially now that the velo stuff has come out, um, you know, everyone, want, everyone wants to throw hard. So they're doing all kinds of different things to increase the velocity and you kind of get away from what your body does naturally. For me, that's what I try to do, to get a guy in the natural arm slot if he's not there, try to square up his body, get him as efficient as possible in the mechanic side of it, and, uh, and uh, get him just as efficient as possible. So, yeah, you know, athlete, repeatable mechanics, uh, you know, one of the biggest things now also is is uh, the velo training, and that, and that thing 
you know, the weighted ball stuff, everybody thought it was kind of a new deal. Tom House started a lot of that stuff way back there, took it like a, a little bit of time off, and then they've kind of re increased it back. I, as I go out and look at pitchers, I, I like I like their velo to as as a, as a young kid to increase the incremental uh, incremental steps as opposed to all of a sudden this guy goes from eighty in, in in six months he's throwing ninety miles an hour and I'm going I, I don't know about that and also I'm a little leery of kids that are throwing at huge velocities at a really young age I always. Um, you know, look back at some of the little league guys that had a bunch of success and were crazy, and then you uh, you don't hear much about them later on in college or even playing in college, and a lot of them had a lot of success at the Little League World Series, and so you, you look at that and you go, hey, there are some, but there's not a ton of them that go on and have a lot of success, so I'm big in incremental steps and their velocity coming on where it's a two or three miles an hour per year as they build and learn how to throw strikes and have some success with it. And as their velocity comes up, obviously, if you throw it over the plate, it gives you a, a lot better chance. I, I, I look at it, and this is nothing that I've looked at scientifically, just for me and doing it over years. I think there's a, a maturity jump at like 15 to 18, 20 to 23, and your last one as far as, you know, before it starts going downhill a little bit, somewhere between 26, 28 years old. And I think, uh, you know, as you look at it, those are your natural maturity ages where you might make a jump as you get in there. Now, it's different for different kids and, and depending on how you mature and stuff like that. But uh, uh, and then I look for the ability to, to spin the ball. I, I, I think it's it's uh, some guys as, as the good Lord has made it fortunate for some guys to throw hard. I also think they have the ability to spin the ball and also pronate. Uh, to where it gives them some off-speed efficiency. Um, you know, everybody, uh, when Major League Baseball was on strike, we had Ben Joyce here, and uh, and we were playing, and nobody in Major League Baseball wasn't it, so everybody got to see Ben Joyce, and he was just coming off Tommy John surgery, so they didn't get to, you know, that our season started in February. I don't think we even let him spin a ball until about the 1st of, uh, of February. And so... Uh, you know, everybody saw his fastball, his breaking ball was a little bit behind because of, you know, we're looking out and Tony was looking out for his best interest. And so, uh, you know, I, I think some guys also have the ability to spin it, pronate, do a lot of different things uh, to allow themselves to be successful with their secondary pitches. I'm still a believe, believer that, uh, you know, there's four basic pitches, fastball, changeup, curveball, slider. Uh, and then there's subsets off of them. I'm not a huge cutter guy. I'm not to say you can't have them. For me, it's kind of a bad slider a lot of times. And it also is somebody that doesn't have a real high ability to spin a ball. And that's not saying that they don't. I mean, Corbin Burns, I watched him pitch a lot when my son was on with the Brewers. A hey, phenomenal stuff. A great cutter. And he can still throw his secondary, other secondary pitches. Those guys are outliers. They really are. And so I think, um, you know, those are the four basic things, uh, four basic pitches. And then everything off that is a little bit of, of an outlier as far as guys having success. And then I mean, Devin Williams and those guys, it's crazy stuff, you know, uh, different things. So basically, uh, athlete, uh, what I look for, athlete, repeatable delivery. Uh, I am, I'm, I'm not a huge velocity guy, but we've had huge velocities around here. People always want to know why. Uh, again, Q does a great job. Our trainer does a great job. Uh, our nutrition side of it. Tony really protects our guys. And then, you know, I'm probably the last part of that deal. I have a little bit to do with it. But anyway, and as I go out, uh, you know, from the, from that's pretty much the physical side. As I go out, I, I like to look uh, also, and, I, and I'm old. And so I look for these things probably more so. Um, you know, how, how's the kid, how good a teammate is the kid? How does he interact with uh, his teammates and his coaches? That's a big deal for me. I don't sit behind home plate in the group. Obviously, most of the guys out there now are younger anyway, so I kind of am, am on the side. That's kind of the way I've always done it, though. Uh, but I like to I like to get there early. I like to see how he, how he reacts with the rest of his group. Uh, also, you know, I, I also like to see, uh, 
you know, how he treats his parents, that's me, uh, and especially his mother. You know, I, I, I like to see uh, how, how they treat, you know, people and, uh, you know, how, how they are on an interaction basis, relationship-wise like that. And, it, and, it, and I'm not talking about kids being, uh, you know, hey, the best, some of the best players I've ever had are some of the biggest pains in the butt that you'll have. And, and those are the guys that, that, you, that uh, will compete for you and, uh, and do those things. So it doesn't always, hey, you know, some of the greatest guys are, would be the first guy to help you change your tire or, you know, do something like that if you have a flat tire. Now, they also, like I said, can be a big pain in the ass because most of the really good players have some personality about them. They're ornery. Uh, they like to have a good time, but they also like to compete. And so those are kind of the, the different things that I look for in a pitcher. Uh, you know, they also asked me uh, about athletes, you know, what I look for in an athlete if I'm out there recruiting. Uh, I, I do the pitching here. Like I said, I was a position player first. Uh, to me, and, and I'm talking about, since I've been doing this, I mean, this is my 40th year, the, and I didn't see him in person, and I don't think I ever saw him play in person, actually, but to watch on TV, uh, and then I'll go back to what I saw in person, but King Griffey Jr., you know, if he hadn't started getting hurt, was, I, 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 don't, I don't know if there was anybody better. The swing was crazy. The defense was crazy. He could run. He could do all those type things. He's probably my 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 favorite guy that uh, I got to watch. And, it, and you know, as he started getting older, he started getting hurt and stuff. But it was phenomenal what he did at 19 years old. And it was fun to watch those guys. So he's kind of the uh, uh, Mike Perry Wood as far as a position guy. The guy that I saw in person plays now, uh, and this, to me, this was a crazy story, was Bryce Harper. And I'd heard about, about Bryce Harper. He'd been on on you know front of I think Sports Illustrated at 14 or 15 or whatever it might have been you start hearing about this guy and then I saw him he graduated early I think he got a GED or whatever happened and he goes early to Southern Nevada at like 16 17 years old and I got to see him play in the Junior College World Series I went out and saw him work out and I'd never heard a ball come off aluminum bat like that it sounded like shotgun blast and uh, and so. Uh, and people don't really, I mean, I, I don't think they re remember that uh, he was an outstanding catcher. He could catch, he could throw, he could block, he could do all those type things. Obviously, the bat was the deal that was going to carry him. And so they, you know, uh, took him out from behind the plate. But it was interesting. The game I was, I got to see, I got to see him play a couple of games. But one of the games at the Junior College World Series, I got to see him and he gets kicked out of the game from making a line in the dirt. And there's 10 or 12,000 people there to watch him play and you know everybody's kind of disappointed obviously and uh and but it kind of I mean very competitive he's 16 or 17 playing with college guys and he, I mean, he's by far the best guy on the field and he ends up going I can't remember first or second overall that year with uh I think Strasburg and him went one two or vice versa or something like that but uh he's probably the the best I've ever seen in person at such a young age and uh you know, the, the biggest thing uh, that uh, when I go out and see a position player is the fact that, hey, man, will they compete? Will they will they get after it? Uh, do they like to be in the middle of it when it gets tough? I mean, a lot of people give lip service to that. Obviously, he didn't. He still doesn't. He's fun to watch. Uh, a lot of guys like to talk the talk. They don't like to get in there and compete and do the things that you got to do. And that's at all levels. And I've watched that. Uh, you know, like I said, fortunate with my son. I've watched that with his career, and you watch the games, and you still have that. Those guys are so talented, but there will be guys that shy away from big situations, even at that level. And so that's yeah, a big deal for me as I go out there and look at the guys and watch the guys. Uh, another example I'll give you, I, I've, I've been fortunate. Uh, uh, Alex Bregman, I've known him since he was in, in grade school. He's another one of the guys, and, and not a phenomenal athlete. I mean, Bryce, I don't know how Bryce ran, but uh, Bregman was, uh, his his motor was different than everybody else's. I, I, I saw him play in Arizona, about 110, 15 degrees. He was playing at a, a, a tournament, lower tournament, age-wise, plays two games, comes over, also is playing with the older guys, gets there, he's picking up the bats, he's the, he's the 
the, the bat boy picking him up. He's into the game. He's yelling. That's after playing two games at another field. And I can remember uh, talking to the guys with USA Baseball about him and trying to talk him into taking him and to USA Baseball. And they kind of did me a favor because I had some guys with him. And the guy ended up being, I think, the USA Player of the Year that year as a 15 or 16 year old. And uh, and, it, and his deal, and, and I don't know if it still is, but when I saw him and been around him, it was about, hey man, nobody was gonna outwork him, nobody was gonna outcompete him. And uh, and then, you know, we didn't, I mean, just, it was, it was what you saw every day was phenomenal. And, and he, he always brought it. And so it was interesting to see another guy that, and this is an older guy too, Pedroia was the same way. I saw him at Arizona State, he played short, he played above his ability. And hey, he was basically going to try to wheel his team to victory, and it was, it was fun to watch. Uh, and there's no analytical measurement for this. We have all kinds of testing, and Major League Baseball has all these tests that they give guys. I don't know that, uh, that I've seen any of them that are highly successful as far as some of those tests, uh, as far as wanting to get after, compete, and stuff like that. You know, and it's interesting. You just watch the World Series this past year, and Evan Carter, I think we had Evan Carter in camp. And, you know, the Rangers kind of, they, they stuck with him and took him in the second round higher than a lot of people even had him in. And obviously uh, it's not, you know, cutting stone and scouting's not cutting stone, but that guy so far has been phenomenal. And here's a guy that was from Tennessee and the Rangers do a great job of scouting and, and got to know the kid and the background. And I think he was valedictorian and with his class and his family and all that stuff. It kind of gives you a pretty good idea of, of where you fit in. Uh, anyway, that's that's my stuff on pitching, what I look for, an athlete, uh, very generic kind of questions or answers to, to that question. But uh, it's it, uh, it, it, a little bit all over the map, but those are kind of the base things. All right, uh, now to get to Q. Hey, I love Q. Uh, yeah, I always give him bad time. I always say he's the first guy I've ever turned over a hold of running a street and training over to. It actually was the second one. And the first one was a gal named uh, Meg Ritchie when I was at Texas Tech. And uh, she was phenomenal also. And uh, and and uh, she was our head strength coach at Texas Tech football. And she did them all. And she oversaw all of them. And uh, But since her, she was the first guy that uh, that I've turned it all over to. And uh, like I told you, when I first started, hey, we did major mu main muscle groups uh, and, and we maxed all the time. Uh, when I turned it over to Q, we talk about it and it's evolving all the time. I kind of give him a little bit of input, but I turn it over to him. I, 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 uh, I mean, that's his area of expertise. Uh, and, and I, I just think uh, I don't really want to step on his toes. Do I give him some, you know, hey, I'd like to do this or I'd like to do that. When I first started, uh, you know, coaching pitchers, hey, we ran all the time. We didn't hardly do any weights, uh, all those type things. Now, hey, we have a, we have a uh, you know, uh, band program, a weighted ball program before we start. The mobility starts ahead of that. Uh, all the different things that we do now as compared to a, hey, I don't want to say we just walked out and maybe stretched your arm a little bit and got after it, but it wasn't too far from that. And so things have changed uh, tremendously. Uh, he, he prepares us. He does all the pre-practice stuff, as he talked about earlier, uh, all the mobility, all the different things that we get, go into before they even get on the field. That's a huge one for us. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, I always walk in there and I'm a little bit different. Obviously, I don't want to, when I first start doing the pitching stuff, hey, I, I would micromanage everything they did. I don't like to do that. We set out a plan for him. Q does a great job. I'll go through before practice a lot of times. And I just want to see who, who is and who did, who is it and who isn't. Because here's the thing that happens. Those guys that take care of the business are going to have success on the field. And so it's interesting. Hey, if I got to go in there and kick you to go do the pre-practice stuff, hey, you're probably going to shirk the deal somewhere along the time, uh, uh, along the line, and we're not going to be as successful as we want them to be. Uh, he also sets up the post-throwing stuff, the routines, 
Uh, very important. Guys always want to stay around and see how the games play out, and I get it. But now we have as many monitors and stuff. They can watch the games. They can do their post throwing stuff. He sets up all that stuff. I, uh, uh, as after we uh, got there and, and talked to Q, uh, we kind of we changed things a little bit. Uh, obviously, he talked about the sprint work. We basically do all the sprint work. Now we do a bunch of, uh, not a bunch, but we have a, a bike day, a jump rope day. Uh, I mean, he kicks them pretty good on the bikes. I like that. Uh, the sprint work, I like that a lot. I kind of miss a little bit of distance throwing or distance running. That's all we did. I mean, we did miles and miles and miles. Uh, I, I do kind of miss maybe a day of that a little bit. I talked to one of my buddies that was a professional boxer, and I always uh, balance it out. Hey, guys are kind of like boxers. Hey, they throw short bursts over a long period of time, hopefully. Same thing. Hopefully your pitcher stays out there a while. Your boxer, hopefully you stay out there for a while. Uh, they still do a little bit of distance running. And a lot of it is more mental than physical. Uh, you know, I'm throwing this at Q. I, I haven't really talked to them about it much, but they're, they're uh, you know, from the mental side, I kind of miss that a little bit. I do understand why we do the sprint work and the bikes and the jump rope and all the quick burst stuff. Uh, but I do kind of miss that side because I think it's a mental deal a little bit. But anyway, that's uh, that's old school to new school. Uh, and then the modalities, I mean, you know, all the saunas, hot tub, cold tub. Uh, one of the biggest things for us, I think, is body alignment. Q helps with that. Our trainers help with that. Our, our trainer, uh, Jeff Wood, helps with that. I think that's huge. Uh, as, as I've done this for a long time and you have guys that pitch, especially for 10, 15 years, their body just starts to turn to their dominant side. And so body alignment is huge for those guys. And uh, anyway, uh, so that's kind of that's kind of how I work with him. I, and that's very generic. And I'm telling you, I have uh, such high regard for him. So I've pretty much turned all, over all that stuff uh, because he's an expert on it. He's studied a lot more than I have. I worked at it. And done some things, but that's his area of expertise. So, hey, we're going to go with it and and allow him to have the freedom to do what he does, and that's why he's so successful. Now he comes to me. We talk on a daily basis, and we had some guys. There's so much YouTube stuff and podcasts and all this. Guys are always overthinking things. If there's a kid that hey, maybe I'd like to do this, it will sit down and and talk myself. Q, we'll talk to the kid. You know, they all have throwing people back home. They've had strength coaches back home. Everybody's doing a little bit different. They, but we're going to work it individually for each kid, and I think he does such a good job with that. Uh, you know, in conclusion, uh, 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 Q talked about this. If I could, if I could have a, a guy be a multiple sport guy, I wish guys would do that a little bit more. I think that's body movement wise. I think that was good for guys. Uh, uh, you know, things have just changed and, and it's it's just different now. You know, I, I can't tell you the last time I saw a guy ice his arm and that used to be a staple for us. I, uh, you know, we threw all the time and we don't, you know, guys don't throw, I don't think quite as much. Now we throw quite a bit in our program, but a lot of them have, have cut back. I, I do think it's good for your body and good for muscle memory. We still do, we still do a lot of flat rounds, short boxes, stuff like that to protect guys. But also, you know, I always argue with my son, guys used to throw 300 innings, they had four starters, they do a lot of different things, but uh, the game's harder. The position players are better, they're better shaped, they're bigger, they're stronger. Uh, and you go back to the 70s, maybe maybe early 80s, before that, uh, the shortstop was usually not a great hitter, the second baseman wasn't a great hitter, center fielder maybe not, and the pitcher used to hit all the time. And so you got four guys right there in your lineup that might not be able to hit that well. And so and you're worried about five guys. So the game has evolved now. Hey, the second baseman's an offensive guy, the shortstops, I mean, obviously like Seeger. I mean, they got guys like that. There's very few holes in lineups anymore. So things have evolved and there's not a, there's not many breaks in the lineup as you're as you're throwing and you're pitching and doing those type things. But uh, anyway, that's kind of the, the gist of my deal right there. If you guys got any questions, I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Uh, you know, last thing that I'll show you right here, this deal right here is a, a deal that we do. And to kind of give you an idea, that this thing is is our calendar. One of the serious things is we don't have guys for uh, 
the, basically in a month of December and, and the first part of January. Q and I, our strength coach, uh, our, our Q and I, our trainers, uh, uh, our video people, our, our analytics people, we set up this deal and basically give them a day day by day deal from the first of December all the way through the fifteenth of January when we we can work with them again. And and it it tells them exactly you know their weight training, their arm care, what level they are, their running, uh, everything they have to do, their bullpens. And then, you know, the other side of it, it, it basically choreographed their bullpens. And if they do it, fine. If they don't, if they got something they like better, at least we have given them something. But I really like this for our guys. We've done it now uh, quite a few years because I, 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 I always worry about them when they go home. This deal right here is, is uh, kind of at least takes it uh, where I don't feel bad if somebody comes back and they have to take care of this because we get, at least give them the outlines of the deal right there. And she has done a great job uh, helping us set that up. So when they come back, they're ready to roll. But anyway, hey, that's kind of my spiel. If you got any questions, I appreciate you having me on. Apologize for not being there in person, but obviously uh, I'm smart enough to be where I need to be at the time. Thanks a lot.